Hi everyone, welcome to day 44 of Praying Through the Psalms. Today we are looking at some interesting, very different from each other psalms that are going to challenge us in, in a good way, I think. Um, psalms 87 and 88. So 87 is a psalm of praise written by our worship leaders, the sons of Korah. And it's praise of God, of course, but in particular of God's holy city, Zion, which is used interchangeably with Jerusalem. Um, and it's praising it because of the nature of the city itself. It is founded on God's holy mountain. So Jerusalem is the site where Abraham brought Isaac to be sacrificed. If you remember that story from Genesis, he brings his son to sacrifice him on the altar at Mount Moriah, which is the one and the same as the location of Jerusalem. But instead, uh, he finds that God provides a ram to, um, I think it's a ram, a sheep, something to sacrifice instead. And he, Isaac is spared. And it's turns out that it's a test of Abraham's faith and it's also a chance for God to teach everyone that will become part of the Israelite faith that he is not going to ask for human sacrifice. Most of the religions in the ancient Near East did participate in such things. So that was a, a wide departure from what was going on in the region in the time. And so God used that as a teaching circumstance, not just for Abraham, but for everybody. There also David erected an altar at the threshing floor of Aruna. Um, this happened after his sin in counting the men. This is found um, in Chronicles and Kings. And he prays to God there for God to stop the plague on the people that has resulted because of this sin of David. And then it's also the site, as we know, of God's temple, both the temple that was built by David's son Solomon and the one rebuilt after the people returned from exile. Um, Nehemiah leads that rebuilding efforts. And currently, it is um, the location of a Muslim place of worship called the Dome of the Rock. But the Jewish people believe and have the hope that um, the temple will be rebuilt there. It's something talked about in the book of Daniel, actually. So it's a very significant place, a place of sacrifice, a place of God's presence, a place of mercy. One day, this will be the spiritual home of all faithful people. And the ending verse, verse 7 in the NIV says, as they make music, they will sing, all my fountains are in you. A better translation would be, all my springs are in you, because they're talking about this city as being the origin of water, which of course is what gives and sustains life. They would not have built cities in this time without having a source of water there. And so the fact that they're claiming this is the source of all water shows its importance. And as uh, you would see if you've read the um, book of Revelation, you will see in there talk of springs of living water coming from Zion at the end times after God restores and creates a new earth, a new heavens and earth, then from Zion will come streams of living water. So it's quite significant in its location. It's believed to be where Jesus will return when he returns again to this very same physical location. The conclusion of the psalm and the underlying importance is that we are all one. God is our creator as human beings. One day as believers, we will live together in eternity and we are all loved and we all matter equally. This is a precursor to what Jesus is going to teach us and the writers of the New Testament, that in Christ there is no longer male or female, slave or free, Jew or Gentile, but we are all one together. And we're already seeing talk of that here, already in the Old Testament, this idea that indeed we all have worth and we are all loved equally by God. So indeed this is a psalm worthy of praise. And then we look at quite a different psalm in Psalm 88. Here we have an individual lament also written by the sons of Korah. And this is as true of a lament as we get. Um, 
akin to Psalm 22, except Psalm 22 ends with hopefulness. And so it shouldn't surprise us that in the Book of Common Prayer, this was designated as a psalm to be sung on Good Friday. It's an example of faith in which the psalmist trusts God completely despite feeling like God has abandoned him. Really, the only hopeful note in this psalm is that his faith causes him to cry out to God from the darkness. I happen to really like this psalm. My personality type is um, a little bit tending towards melancholy, not in a negative way, just, you know, we all have different personality types, and there's some of us that are just more quiet, reflective, have more of a poetic nature to us, and that's how I am, and so this resonates with me. It resonates with me as a pastor, and just learning how important it is to sit with people in their pain and to allow them to sit in that pain, not to rush the process of grieving too quickly. And certainly many times I have only, the only comfort I can supply is to comfort people that because you are grieving, it does not mean you don't have faith. That in fact, grieving, being sorrowful, feeling like the psalmist does in this psalm is what faithfulness is about. So this psalm teaches us how to sit for a moment in the darkness the pain and the struggle of life. Here the psalmist teaches us that it is okay to not be okay. And in fact, telling God this is an act of worship. It is an act of faith to admit this to God. It is okay to feel this way. So the psalmist asks for deliverance in this psalm, but not just for his own sake. We note something very typical of the psalms. He points to the fact that, you know, God, how can I praise you if I'm dead? So this showcases that undeveloped understanding of the afterlife that they had, and that indeed, you know, whatever they thought about the afterlife, it was, I think, predominantly that they were just going to be resting, that there wouldn't be any active relationship with God once they died. Of course, now in Jesus, we know that that's not true. And in fact, we will be able to praise God forever and ever when we close our eyes to this world. But for the psalmist, for his sake, he asks God to preserve his life so that indeed he can continue to praise God. But even that is not enough to draw him out of his despair. And so his concluding words are, darkness is my closest friend. And that is sad and difficult to read, but also so very authentic. Uh, Perhaps you have felt that way. Perhaps you are feeling that way right now. When you are in a time of deep grief, that is exactly what that feels like. You feel very alone, even if you're surrounded by people. And truly, it is a physical pain that you feel from the sorrow that has taken hold. And so we see in this psalm that his questions are not answered. It it reminds us somewhat of the book of Job. The psalmist is not rescued. God does not come to his rescue yet, although we assume that that will happen. He is at the end of the psalm in just as much pain as he was when he began. But he cries out to God anyway. He understands that all is not lost. He grasps onto the tiniest glimmer of hope that is found in knowing God. That indeed God is able to rescue. God is trustworthy. God is not going to leave us alone, although we might feel like it. It's not true. It is a feeling. It is not true. A hundred percent guarantee you God will never leave you alone. God is with you always. So even if you feel like that, you can just tell yourself, it's not true. God is with me. And the psalmist is able to hold on to that. And my friends, that is enough. That is enough. It is okay to not be okay. It's okay to sit in your pain for a while. We cannot move forward until we get out all of those feelings bottled up within us. It is healthy to lament. It is part of the grieving process. It's so unfortunate that at least in our Western culture, grief has become something that's seen as very private and people want to keep it that way. I thought it was interesting when the Queen of England died in September and a lot of commentators were saying, oh, we feel so terrible for the family that they have to grieve in such a public way. And I was thinking, how wonderful. Yes, it's hard, but it's so good for us to see that and to know that it is okay to grieve and grief should have some elements of 
public publicness to it. In the Old Testament, they would rend their clothes and put ashes on their head and they would go about wailing. Um, in Jewish faith today, they, they sit Shiva for a week where they sit with one another in their grief. There, there is something to that. And I, I wish that we could have like a master class for society on grieving and that grieving indeed is okay. And then I wish we could go back to the traditions of wearing black for as long as we need to, to show that we are grieving because nowadays you're out and about and you just have no idea sometimes what people are carrying around with them. So I like this Psalm for that reason, as difficult as it is, it's so important. And when you are in this place, how wonderful to know that there are words that you can pray and that God receives that as worship. He receives your grief as worship. So you don't have to feel like you're not doing enough in God's eyes. It's enough to just pour out your heart to him. So the challenge is, when might we pray these Psalms? These are probably not, hopefully not going to be regular incorporations in our prayer life. Not that Psalm 87 isn't good, it's a psalm of praise, but it's so specific about the location of Zion, um, probably not something we're going to pray on a regular basis. I think to make it applicable for ourselves or to, to make it relatable, it could be a good psalm of praise for the unity that God gives us through faith and love, for a reminder that we're all equal, we're all loved, we all matter. In Jesus, this is made evident. We are one. We are different, yet we have this unity in Jesus Christ. And so um, this, while maybe not something we're going to pray every single day, is still a good reminder to praise God for this. Like, this is something I shamefully wouldn't think to praise God about very often. But yes, how true this is, that we can be united. And I've seen it so much in this ministry that I've started, this online Bible study um, devotional practice ministry where I have people that join in from all over the world and who speak different native languages and come from different cultures and backgrounds. And yet we all have found our way to this space because we long to know more about God, to study his word, and to draw closer in relationship. So yes and amen to this psalm. Maybe I should amend my words. Maybe this should be in our regular rotation. And then Psalm 88, this is one to pray when we simply need to sit with our grief and pain. So I hope that this is not one that you need to pray on a regular basis, but it might be for a season. When you are going through grief, this might be one you pull out every single day. It might be the only prayer you can muster, and that is okay. Uh, and then that might be a couple of months, a year, you know, whatever it takes to work through that cycle of grief and to remind yourself that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to simply cry out to God and to let those cries linger in the air for a while. God is, God is okay with that, and he is there with you in that pain. So... <laughs> An interesting conjunction of psalms. Sometimes they work well together and sometimes they're exact opposites. But I think even in when they're opposites, there's so much beauty in that, that these both find their place in the Psalter. These are both received as worship. The highest of praise and the deepest of grief. God sees it all as an act of sacrifice and worship and relationship. How amazing is that? We indeed worship a truly good and loving God. So today I'm going to pray them both as odd as that might sound because I expect that in this group listening there are people who are in the place of high praise and I suspect that there's people going through a time of deep grief and all sorts of people in between. And whether we're in one of these locations, surely we know someone who is feeling this. And so we can hold those people in our minds as well as we praise. So I will make this more of a contemplated, contemplative prayer today where we sort of think through these things, our praise of God, and then um, crying out to God in a potentially time of grief. So let us pray. Gracious God, you founded your city on the holy mountain, the same mountain where Abraham brought his son, his, his son of promise, his son he had waited so long for. He brought his son there to be obedient 
thinking that he needed to sacrifice that son and trusting that God you would provide something else. I think he knew all along that he wasn't actually going to have to do it. He knew you at that point and knew that you would provide some other alternative. And indeed you did, God. You stayed his hand and you provided an alternative sacrifice and father and son journeyed back down the mountain together. What a gift of love and mercy. Father, you founded your city on the same place where David came to you in deep repentance for his sins, crying out to you to save the people from a plague that was the result of something David had done. And you received it, God, and you listened, and you stopped the plague because you hear our prayers, you hear our cries, and you accept our repentance, God. You show us mercy. It is a place of mercy. And gracious God, you founded your city on the mountain where your glorious temple was constructed, where then your very presence was thought to reside in the times of the Old Testament, where thousands upon thousands upon millions of prayers have been spoken to you in grief and in joy and in everything in between, God. All those precious words spoken by people crying out to you in their own times of need or darkness or mountaintop moments. How holy is that ground? God, today people still come from all over to tuck their written prayers into the cracks of what remains of those ancient walls. And Lord, you receive it all, you hear it all, you see it all, and you love us all. You are so good and so gracious and so merciful. Truly glorious things can be said about you, God, because you bring together people from all over the world, people from different backgrounds, people who look differently, who speak different languages, rich people and people who have not as much material wealth. You bring together people with large families and people who are searching for families. You bring the lonely and the lost. You bring the joyful. You bring parents and sisters and brothers and husbands and wives. You bring teachers and lawyers and doctors and construction workers and nurses and teachers and bus drivers and city workers. God, you bring us all together and you knit us together as one. You whisper in our ear, I love you. You matter. You are all equal. You are all loved. And so God, let us praise you for that, for that acceptance, for that love, for the equality and the unity that we can find in you, God, that in a world that seems to want to divide and to remind us of our differences, you remind us that in Jesus Christ, we are brothers and sisters knit from the same substance, made in your image, given your very breath. And God, in Jesus, we will worship and praise you in your holy mountain for eternity. What a beautiful image that is, God. Certainly something worthy of praising you. And we thank you, God, that you love us that much. But Lord, we also acknowledge today that there are some in our midst, maybe even ourselves, who are feeling such grief and such pain. God, some of us tonight or today or this morning or whenever we listen to this prayer, some of us cry out and say, God, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. Lord, some of us are praying and telling you that we are overwhelmed with troubles. We feel as if we are to the point of death. We feel as if we are down in the pit with no strength to climb out, God. We feel as if we are lying in a grave, cut off from everything, even from you. 
God, sometimes it feels like we're in the deepest pit, in the darkest depth, that you are overwhelming us with waves of grief and sorrow and pain, and we can't climb out. And in that place, we feel all alone, as if even our closest friends have been taken from us. There is no escape, and our eyes grow dim with grief. So we call to you, Lord, every day. We spread out our hands from that pit and ask you to raise us up. God, thankfully, we cling to your words that in Jesus Christ, indeed, there is hope. There is more. There is restoration. There will be a day when there will be no more of this pain, where there will just be joy and light and love. But God, in the midst of this, it's hard to see that. It's hard to cling to that hope. And so we cry to you for help. In the morning, our prayer comes before you, God. We pray, why does it feel like you are rejecting us and hiding your face? God, why does it feel like we have been surrounded like a flood, like we are drowning and you've taken from us our friends and our neighbors? God, sometimes it feels like darkness is our only and our closest friend. And so God, in this moment, if this is us, if this is someone we love, we whisper our name or their names to you and we just linger here in this grief, in this pain, in this darkness. We linger not as people without hope, for indeed, there is hope. We linger as people of faith, because in the very act of crying out to you, our faith is represented. We linger as authentic human beings who feel undone and who look to you to be remade, to be made whole, to be given peace and comfort. God, be with us whether it's in the highest of joys or the deepest of griefs, whether we're wandering through a desert, struggling to reclaim our faith, whether we are in that monotonous time of life where one day seems no different than the next, God, whether we are searching for what comes next, whether we journey into an unknown future, Wherever we are, God, we know that you are there, and we thank you for that truth. We love you, and we pray these things with tender hearts, thanking you in advance that you hear us, and you see us, and you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.